So my name is Ward Seeger and I want to quickly talk about the science of popularity today. Um, how do we measure the popularity of TV content? What does it even mean for something to be popular in this day and age? And why is it even important that, that we actually measure it? So to recap, or to start with, I guess, let's recap some of the, the latest developments in this space uh, to set the context and then we'll delve deeper into it. Um, starting with three key trends that we're seeing across the industry, a really rapid proliferation of content distribution platforms around the world. Um, so over here in the US, we talk about the big, big net networks and Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and YouTube, but actually there's over a thousand OTT platforms around the world, and that number is only going up. Think about a broadband penetration, barrier to entry decreasing. So what that means is that audiences are now more fragmented than ever across all of those platforms. Unprecedented fragmentation, really. Um, and what that means is that our ability as an industry to measure these audiences across all those platforms is becoming exponentially less and less effective. So suddenly we're in a paradigm where the industry needs to very quickly move away from what used to be a perfectly okay model of paneling and serving people and, and platforms to a more empirical approach to measurements. So a more empirical approach to understanding this relationship between consumers and content around the world and in all of its forms that we're gonna delve into over the next few minutes. Um, and at the heart of that is what do consumers want? What content do they want? What is really popular? Uh, we can't generalize. What do specific consumers want in specific parts of the world and specific times of the day and so on and so forth? So this, this question has become increasingly more complex and it's almost as if we suddenly woke up to a world where popularity is in the eye of the beholder. What metrics do we use to measure whether something's popular? What combination of metrics do we use to measure whether something is popular? Because it means, and it's important, because it means different things to different people. So if you're a linear network, for you, largely, you live and die by your ad revenue. So your linear rating is what you care about. If you're an ESVO platform, the two metrics you really care about are your subscriber growth and retention. And yet, we need a universal system. We need a global system that tells us universally the truth of what is popular across all platforms and with a lens of what it really means for each of these different players. So our solution to this is this system that we developed that says, hey, we can now measure global demand for content around the world. So why don't we go out and try to capture all the different forms, all the different ways where we can assess the popularity of content. So if people are watching a TV show or they're researching it or they're reading about it or they're critiquing it or talking about it on social media or they're blogging about it or they're pirating it, they're legitimately streaming it, they're torrenting it, they're rating it and, and discussing it and microblogging about it and so on and so forth. And let's develop a system that allows us to combine all of these different signals into a, a single measurement system. So in short, if I watch three back-to-back -back episodes of a TV show, that is a stronger indication of demand than if I write a comment about it on a social media platform. So let's actually develop a system and once you have after five years of R&D, you are then able to process over a billion data points a day from all of these different sources in over 100 languages around the world, and, and you're able to measure the popularity of content across all platforms in every single country on the planet. So now, with this system, we can now quantify, and I'll delve into again what that means, this relationship between consumers and content around the world, across these different platforms. So it allows us to answer questions that previously were almost impossible to answer. So starting with really easy ones, like what were the top shows in the US last week? Well, that's quite easy to do. Um, let's go to China. What were the top shows in China in June this year? Let's go three months back. Uh, three Chinese shows, one Korean show, and one US show were the top in the top five in, in China over the month of June. Um, let's stay in China. How did these OTT platforms compare to each other in a market where they hadn't yet launched in? This is across 2016. So a system that allows us to measure the demand for entire platforms in any market around the world, but as well as every individual title within these platforms. Let's go earlier, 2015 in France. It turns out the French in 2015 really liked their fantasy and their mystery dramas, but they didn't really like their sci-fi dramas. And so, a system, again, that allows us to understand the peculiar, or rather, the nuances of local country, local market trends. So understanding that in South Korea, 90% of the top content or top dramas are local Korean dramas. 
again, really, really important, on the, a system that allows us to stay in the same market in South Korea to compare the popularity of a Korean drama with a US drama over time, in real time, right, any period of time, in that local market. And it allows us to understand the impact of local and global marketing and event campaigns and on the pop local popularity of these shows in that local market. Again, now we want to understand over a longer period of time, so across all of 2016, how the episodic patterns of these TV shows moves. Um, what about these season releases, right? So these are three new and returning seasons across 2016 on Netflix, and you can see the day zero launch binge watching pattern, the demand drops, second weekend binge when people finish watching the season, and a decline. So we're now unable to understand why they need to invest in so many original series to keep these spikes up averaged across the entire your ear. Um, the impact of winning an Emmy Award on a TV show, how does that impact the popularity of a TV show? How does the release of a, an app impact the demand for the TV show of a related property as well? And so on and so forth. We can delve deeper and deeper and deeper. But what I really want to do is leave you guys just with a couple of questions, really more questions than answers about this new world and, and paradigm that we're going into um, of what it means for something to be popular. If you had 5 million people each expressing one expression of demand for a TV show and one million people each expressing five times that for another TV show. Are both TV shows equally as popular? Again, it depends who you ask, because for an ESVA platform, if you have that TV show that targets the one million people for a consumer attraction and retention, that's really what's important. If, you're, if you want to do some passive mass market advertising, then you really want to hit the five million people show. Um, this is a cluster network. This is what 15 million people's online TV consumption in the United States in July looks like. Every dot on this network is a TV show. The brighter the dot, the more people consume that TV show. The lines between the dots indicate when people finish watching a TV show and move on to the next TV show. So now we can start to understand niche content and mainstream content. More importantly, we can now understand and develop metrics like loyalty versus affinity. What does it mean if you introduce a show into the network or if you take out a show into the net from the network? So if you're programming an ESVA platform or a linear network, what does it mean if you, if you lose one of your shows? What impact is it going to have on the network? What impact is it going to have on other shows around it? So we can start to understand these nuances, um, the relationship between shows, but also at a macro level from an industry point of view, the relationship between networks, how people move from watching certain networks content to other network networks content. Um, What's more scary is all of these relationships happen on a country-specific basis, right? So different TV shows, different networks, different relationships within every country on the planet. So moving forward to stand out, to outcompete both the global and the local players, not only do we need to have great content, but an immense scientific understanding of how that content interacts with consumers in each of these markets around the world. Um, very quickly, I want to leave you again with this. Because of these relationships are rapidly changing, previously you had consumers interacting with content on a single screen, a single device, and now you're getting people interacting with their favorite actress, their favorite artist, their favorite TV show, reading a book about a related TV show. How do you map all of these relationships and how you put them together to give you an overall sense of what's really popular and what works and what doesn't work and for which platform and where. That's really where what we think of it as science meets art. And, and I think that's sort of the, the, the second half of the future that used to be content first. That needs to be a combination of science and art. So that's all. Thank you very much.